Okay, so hello everyone and welcome to the second webinar in our series on the Copernicus data space ecosystem. Before we start, I'd just like to go through a little bit of housekeeping. So for interaction with our guest speaker, this will be exclusively through the chat feature. So please feel free to ask any questions there. Uh, the questions will be addressed periodically with a dedicated Q&A session towards the end. If you have any technical difficulties, especially with audio, uh, or the swap card application, please ensure that your audio device is correctly selected by clicking on the cog at the bottom of the screen. And if problems persist, try accessing the meeting, perhaps via a private browser window. So now, without further ado, I give the floor to Valentin Lupetti, Information and Communication Officer at the Directorate General for Defense, Industry, and Space at the European Commission. Valentin, the floor is yours. Thank you, Evan, and uh, thank you very much for every one of you for, for being here with us today. Um, big thanks as well to William for, for presenting Sentinel Hub today um, as part of the, the, the Copernicus data space ecosystem and um, how it helped to modernize the, the access to, to Copernicus data. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm sure it has been a great, uh, a big game changer for, for, the, for the Copernicus user uh, community. Uh, as it makes the life um, have said, the life easier for for anyone processing uh, Copernicus images or willing to access um, archive and, and various uh, data collection from from our um, corporate communication point of view, um, Sentinel Hub has also changed the way we we advertise Copernicus um, when when we go to events with uh, with DEFIS. Um, first of all, because it's it allows for a more um, a dynamic way of, of show, showcasing uh, satellite imagery, um, but also because it's it easily adapted to the different user communities that that we meet, and um, making it like a very versatile tool to to raise awareness about about Copernicus, about the services and and, and the ecosystem. Um, so, well, I'm glad that this, this kind of tool exists to, to democratize a bit the, the use of, uh, of satellite imagery. And uh, William, I'm uh, happy to give you the floor and to hear more about uh, something in the hub. Okay, thank you very much, Valentin. Yeah, uh, I will get cracking then. Uh, so, yeah, as I already introduced, uh, my name is William Ray and I'm a remote sensing engineer at uh, Synergize Solutions uh, based in, I'm based actually in Austria, uh, but Synergize actually originated in Slovenia. And today I'm gonna to give you a nice introduction to the Sentinel Hub uh, APIs. So actually a lot, what a lot of people may not actually know, um, be interested to see in the chats, um, Sentinel Hubs, Sentinel Hub APIs, are actually free and open to use for all Copernicus data space ecosystem users. Um, traditionally, uh, people have thought Sentinel Hub is, uh, is a paid for service, but as part of uh, the Copernicus data space ecosystem, uh, the APIs are free for all to access Copernicus data through. Uh, there are some, some usage limitations for individual users. Uh, but for power users, such as uh, government agencies, there are commercial options available as well. So the Copernicus data space ecosystem is uh, a data access platform. It's the primary location for the Sentinel missions data, uh, but it's also a data processing uh, center. This is where you can process huge amounts of data in the cloud. And then also visualize this data, whether that's the underlying statistics or the actual imagery itself. And all of this is possible within one single ecosystem. So to, get, uh, to draw this out a little bit more, you can access the Sentinel data through the Copernicus database ecosystem. Copernicus contribution mission data has become available in the, in the last couple of months as well as additional EO data sets, uh, such as the EO derived Korean land cover map, digital elevation models as well. And all of this can be accessed through APIs. In addition to that, you can also quickly uh, search, visualize and perform some light analysis on data within the Copernicus browser, 
that is powered by the Sentinel Hub APIs. And then in, in addition to that, we offer onboard code repositories, cloud computing capacity, as well as some online code labs and interfaces too. Uh, and lastly, the whole system is federated uh, with a single user identity to log into all of these different services. Uh, and just to reiterate, obviously, uh, since the Sentinel missions were first launched, um, I think eight years ago now, uh, uh, the uh, Copernicus data offering has become one of the largest in the world. So currently there's 64 petabytes of data available. And by 2028, this will rise to over 100 petabytes. Um, so the Copernicus database ecosystem is is becoming the authoritative source for this data. So we have the full and up-to-date archives for Sentinel data. And in addition to that, all of this is digitally, digitally traced uh, for a permanent record of, of authenticity as well. Um, but obviously I'm here to talk about Sentinel Hub APIs. So why, why should I be using Sentinel Hub APIs to access the data? Why, what's wrong with just downloading a, a Sentinel-2 granule, for instance? Um, so here I'm going to kind of argue the case why you should be adapting your workflows and migrating to using Sentinel Hub APIs with Copernicus database ecosystem. So looking back at a more traditional approach to EA processing, uh, if you have a similar career path to me, probably back in 2014, you were, you were used to downloading full satellite scenes. Uh, you probably were only interested in a specific area of interest. So you'd then clip your images. You'd then maybe have to stack your bands, maybe reproject it. Um, and all of this, like, you spent a lot more time actually processing data than actually analyzing it. Um, so some of the issues which I, I ran into, I'm sure you have too, is looking at what projection are my images in? like. Is my data optimized for cloud processing? All these gigabytes of data, what do I do with it? You can quickly fill up your computer uh, with all the data you are downloading. Um, and as well as uh, additional factors, this kind of creates a very chaotic, tedious, but also costly workflow. Uh, made accessing EO data difficult for newcomers and even experienced uh, EO uh, analysts like struggle day to day sometimes. So the Sentinel Hub APIs make the Copernicus program satellite imagery accessible to the masses. So all the data is easily accessible to be browsed and analyzed through common APIs. Uh, and this data can then be downloaded or the outputs can be downloaded to your local environment or even streamed through a web application such as the Copernicus browser. And all of this means is you can quickly access the data without having to worry about how do I store the data? How do I process it? How do I read the metadata? How do I stack my sensor bands? All this is dealt with in the background. And this means that everyone can spend more time actually focusing on developing their algorithm or application. So to dive into the APIs, uh, I'm going to talk about three of our core APIs uh, this afternoon. Firstly, the Sentinel Hub Catalog API. Uh, this is an API that implements the stack specification, which describes geospatial information about the different data sets that are used with Sentinel Hub. And this allows you to search all our data collections uh, for a specific AOI or time period as well. Um, this means that you can search the full Sentinel 1, 2, 3, and 5P data collections. And from here, you can gain important metadata such as the cloud cover percentage for a particular granule. Secondly, uh, I'm going to demo later uh, the process API. This is the most commonly used API in Sentinel Hub. Um, this is how you can actually access the, the imagery itself. Um, the great thing about this API is that although, as I've talked about already, satellite imagery has been distributed in tiles, users, when they're using the process API, do not have to care about this. Uh, 
you still have a, a payload uh, going into your, into your API request. So your a time period you're interested in, your area of interest, the data sets, uh, and the kind of processing that you wish to do. But all the complexity of having to clip the data, stack the bands, perform any processing, that's all hidden in the API itself. Uh, and what you return back is just the pixels you're interested in. So for example, maybe you want to derive NDPI for a small area of interest. That's all, that's the only output you would actually need to download. You don't even need to download the red and the near infrared bands, just the derived product. Uh, and this really streamlines your workflows. Uh, you can take this a step further even with our statistical API. This enables you to obtain st statistics calculated uh, on the satellite imagery itself without even having to access the pixels themselves. So in a statistical API request, you can specify your area of interest again, a time period, uh, an eval script, which uh, contains the processing you wish to do, and any other statistical measures you may want to calculate. Uh, and based on these parameters, what you return back is a uh, very simple JSON format file. I'll show you how that looks like uh, in a little bit. Uh, and from this, you can then easily use the popular Python data science li libraries to create a pandas data frame and then plot it in matplotlib. Uh, and all this means is that you don't have to access the pixels, uh, saving you download time, but also saving processing time too. So, uh, the, the meat of this uh, presentation, we're actually going to do a couple of demos. Uh, firstly, I'm going to show you the request builder application. I will just switch my desktop over to that. Uh, here we go. So this is the request builder application, which is available to all Copernicus database ecosystem users. And what this does uh, is acts as a learning tool for people uh, so that you can learn how the APIs work um, in a nice, easy to use graphical user interface. So I'm going to firstly run through how you can build a process API request um, really simply. So firstly, I'm going to look at the data collection box here on the, on the left. Uh, we're going to select Sentinel-2 Level 2A data. Uh, I'm going to pick a time range. Uh, I'm going to go back to 2023. Um, you can see a really cool feature here is that the, all these green highlighted dates are when satellite or when Sentinel-2 acquisitions are available for our area of interest. So I'm going to select the from the 1st to the 31st of July 2023. And we, uh, for my output, I'm going to leave it as it is for now. Um, but I will just expand my area to actually include a larger area of Rome. Um, if I scroll down further, we have access to our eval script here. You can see uh, I've specified an input of band two, band three, and band four, which correspond to the blue, green, and red bands of Sentinel-2. And I'm just returning these bands in a true color uh, band combination. I've added, uh, I'm multiplying each of them by 2.5 just to, to up the brightness. Um, the last thing I want to show is the request preview here. Uh, this is a curl request currently, and you could actually copy and paste this into your terminal and run the request that, in, that, in that method. If you also select this drop down menu, you can also translate uh, your request into different languages as well. So, for instance, you can translate it to the uh, Python, and using the requests library, you can make your request in Python. And you can also uh, uh, translate it to the SHPy. And this is translating it to, uh, to make the request using dedicated Sentinel Hub API Python package. Uh, so you could actually copy and paste this into a Jupyter notebook um, and then actually output the imagery that way. 
So I'll show you an example of that in a little bit. But let's run this request and see what we come back. So in the top right here, uh, after you've logged in, you'll be able to click the send button. And this is actually going to send an API request for us. And as you can see, it's almost instant. Uh, so we have our true color image of Rome here. Uh, currently, this is picking the, the most recent image in uh, July 2023. But you could, uh, by clicking on the options button here, uh, you could actually uh, play, you could actually adjust the settings to tailor the imagery for you. So in cloudier parts of the world, your most recent image might be cloudy. Uh, so there's two ways you could counter this. You could reduce the cloud cover percentage, uh, or you could even change the, the order of the mosaicing. So you could, you could pick the least recent image, for instance. Uh, if I now run this request with the least recent, you can see I actually return a different image. So the least recent image in this instance actually had some cloud cover uh, in the southern part of our area of interest. Uh, but you could also pick the least cloudy as well. And if I send this request, I actually get back probably the most recent image too. Uh, so how, how would I want to change this uh, request to maybe a different band combination? That's really simple to do. We can go down into our eval script here, and I'm actually going to call, call band eight instead of band two. And I'm just going to switch around my bands in the return. So I have band eight, which is the near infrared in the, the red channel, uh, red in the green, and lastly, green band in the blue channel. And all I've done is change the bands here. And if I send this request again, I actually return back a false color composite. So all the red pixels in this uh, response are highly vegetated areas where near infrared reflectance is, is high. Uh, there are also uh, many additional eval scripts you can find. You can visit the custom scripts repository for that. This, is, we'll, this will be all linked in the Copernicus Database Ecosystem Sentinel Hub documentation. Uh, and here you can find numerous examples of different kinds of eval scripts. Uh, these can range from change de detection algorithms to flood detection, uh, pretty much any EO application. If the community has produced it with Sentinel Hub, you can find those eval scripts within the custom scripts repository. Um, in addition to process API, you can also run statistical API requests in Request Builder, um, as well as catalog API as well. So let's look at catalog. And this time I'm gonna pick Sentinel-1 GRD. Uh, I'm gonna pick a area of interest actually somewhere slightly different. Let's go for Paris. Let's create a bounding box. We have a time period still of July, 2023. And we can scroll down here and click Fetch. And we then return back all the Sentinel-1 acquisitions uh, in the month of July 2023. We can actually then expand all, the, all these results and uh, go through the metadata itself. Uh, we can even display the geometry of the uh, acquisition on the map as well. So we can see our area of interest, for instance, here is fully within this particular acquisition. And then you can then use that information to then produce a process API request. Okay, <clears throat> so that concludes what I wanted to talk about with the request builder. I'm now going to move on to the Jupyter Lab. So the Jupyter Lab is another resource as part of the Copernicus data space ecosystem. Uh, this offers you cloud computing uh, capabilities in a nice Jupyter Lab environment. So I'm going to switch tab and come over to the uh, Jupyter Lab. So I've already logged in, uh, but it's a very simple process to do. Uh, but I'm now going to access a Sentinel Hub uh, notebook. So you can go to the left in the file system, click on samples and Sentinel Hub. 
there are several notebooks here, which I really encourage you in your own time to go look into as uh, there's some really cool applications here. Uh, but I'm going to open up this introduction to SH APIs here. And here we're going to run some of our first steps into accessing satellite imagery uh, using Sentinel Hub APIs in the Copernicus data space ecosystem. Uh, so the first thing that we need to do is actually import some libraries. You can see we're importing matplotlib, pandas, as well as the Sentinel Hub Python package as well. Uh, we also have a little function for plotting our images after we've made our requests. So let's run the first couple of cells. Well, the first one. Um, one thing that's really important is actually your credentials with Sentinel Hub. Uh, so this is kind of like a username and a password, except that here we have a client ID and a client secret. Um, there can be some confusion with uh, setting this up. So I'm actually going to run through this uh, this afternoon. So I'm going to treat this as like the first time I'm running this. And what I firstly need to do is uncomment uh, these two lines. And I'm going to be using the get pass library to input my, my details. So to obtain these, you can go to your dashboard uh, over here. And I'm going to go down to user settings. And you can see here, I already have some OAuth clients, helpfully named as test, test two and test three. Uh, I'm going to create a new one uh, this afternoon for this demo. And I will just call this Copernicus demo. I can then simply just create. And this then creates a client ID and a client secret. So I'm going to copy my client ID first, go back to my notebook. And actually, the first I need to also uncomment this line here. And I'm going to actually create a profile here, which can be used uh, uh, in the future when I'm using this Jupyter Lab. Uh, this is useful if you're running this locally, uh, but this would be need to be regenerated each time you're using the uh, Jupyter Lab in the cloud. So I'm going to call my profile CDSE, and I'm now going to run this cell. And it prompts me to enter my client ID. I will copy that, copy that in. And then I'll obtain my client secret back from the dashboard as well. OK, and now I'm all set up, ready to go. So first thing I'm going to do is actually set an area of interest. Here I have an AOI. Uh, it's in southeast Austria. Uh, you can see it in a little bit. First thing we can do actually is just quickly um, calculate how large our process API request will be in a little bit. So there is limitations with this API of 2,500 by 2,500 pixels, uh, but that's still quite a large area at 10 meters resolution. Uh, this limitation is just due to the constraints of cloud computing. Uh, but there are options if you wish to uh, upscale your analysis, which I will go into in the conclusion, re conclusion comments. Uh, the first thing that we can do is run a catalog API request. Uh, the first thing we can do is initialize the Sentinel Hub ca catalog class. And then we can actually build a request. So we're going to use our boundary box. In this instance, we have a time interval of 2022. The month of July, I'm searching Sentinel-2 Level 2A data. And that's all we need to do. We have a few other parameters. There are lots of examples in our documentation you can copy and then adapt to your own use. And then all you need to do is run the cell. And you get back your total number of results, which is eight. And that means that we, we have some data that we can find when we use Process API. Uh, it's not like a, an essential step to do this, but it will save you maybe some debugging down the line. If, if your process API requests return kind of no data, perhaps there is no data for you to actually obtain. So it's a good, a good method to, uh, to test before you pr actually request the actual imagery. So 
Uh, I'm going to show probably what's a very similar example to what we saw in Request Builder, uh, but I'll run a little bit more detail into the eval script itself. So firstly, we're going to return back a true color image. We have our eval script here. We have two functions. We have a, a setup function, which defines our inputs and outputs. So our inputs are just three bands, band two to four. And we also have an output that's just three bands. And you can see here, we're returning back the bands in the true color order. So about the red bands, the green band, and the blue band. We then have our request. Here we're calling Sentinel-2 level 2a again. Uh, and we've also added in a mosaicing order of least uh, CC here. Uh, and we have a time interval actually in May. 2022. So let's uh, let's run this cell and a couple of the cells afterwards. And we're going to return back our image. So here we go. So as simple as that. So it's still a slight request builder, absolutely instant. Um, we could play around here maybe with the mosaicing order. And let's go for the least recent, for instance. Rerun our cells. And you can see we actually return back a, a quite hazy, hazy image. If we go for the, the most recent, we probably return back a different image again. Let's see. Uh, probably the same as the least cloudy, actually. So let's look at something a little bit more uh, advanced. We're going to look at how to visualize NDVI. So here, Again, we have our eval script. You can see actually our inputs and outputs are slightly different this time. We're actually only calling band four and band eight, as well as a, a data mask. And our output is actually four bands this time. So a lot more is actually happening in the evaluate pixel function. The NDVI calculation is the first line. So here we've got uh, band eight minus band four divided by the two bands added together. And then actually we have an image files uh, variable. So this is actually an empty array. And what we're doing is based on the NDVI results, we then populate this with different shades of green. So this is actually an RGB value. Uh, so noughts being black and one being uh, white or bright, the brightest value you can get. And it's all based on, yeah, different shades of green. So we also have a the request body. This is actually the same as what we had previously, but we're just calling it the NDVI eval scripts instead. So I'm going to run this cell and the cells afterwards. And you can see we return back uh, our NDVI image. Uh, we could manipulate this even further. So let's have a look at the final value here, which is the else image files is 0.27. I'm going to change this to naught. I'm actually going to change the red value to, let's say, 0.9. And I'll run these cells again. And you can see, actually, what we've done is we've highlighted all the pixels that have an NDVI value of over 0.6 with red. So it's a really good way of highlighting the most vegetated areas in our area of interest. So lastly, I'm going to run through a, a couple of statistical API uh, examples. Um, but what we're going to do is request and plot an NDVI time series, firstly for a single field in our area of interest, and then actually plot two fields on the same plot in the second example. So. There are a couple of changes to, to be aware of with statistical API. Uh, the default value of our sample type is actually float32 now. This makes sense when we're dealing with uh, vegetation indexes, where our values are uh, in decimals and ranging from minus one to one. Um, the, for process API, the default is UN8, which makes more sense when we're visualizing data. Um, 
In addition to that, our outputs actually have to be explicitly defined. Uh, you can see this actually in our eval script. You can see that, like previously, we're calling uh, the same bands, but our outputs now are actually defined with IDs. So we have an NTBI ID and a data mask ID. So the data mask, even if you're using it, it's an obligatory uh, output every time you run a statistical API request. Uh, it will fail if you don't include this. So actually, this time our evaluate pixel function is actually very simple. Uh, we're not visualizing any data, so we don't need to populate an array. We just need to calculate the index itself. So you can see here we have our index variable, calculation in TBI. And this is then returned in our two uh, output IDs. So our NDPI output is defined as index, which is our calculation. And the data mask is actually specified as samples.datamask. OK, so I can run this cell to define our eval script. Uh, and then I have a couple of fields which I've defined as uh, geojson strings here. So I'll run this cell. Let's have a look at the, the request itself. So again, there's a couple of little changes that have been, needs, you need to be aware of. Like last time, we have a time interval. Uh, I've actually extended it here for from the start of April 2022 all the way to the end of August 2022. So we're looking at the full growing season here. Um, in addition to that, we have an aggregation interval. Uh, this is defined as P10D. And this actually refers to the number of days uh, in each in each interval within our time interval. So a good way to visualize in, this in your head is that you have our full time interval as a loaf of bread. And our aggregation interval is our slices of bread. So each of our time periods is 10 days. If you have a 100 day time period, that means you have 10 slices. Uh, as well as this, uh, we've actually added an additional data filter as well for maximum cloud coverage. So what we're doing here is we're actually excluding all images with over 10% cloudiness uh, in our request. Uh, that means that we can avoid any erroneous values. So NDVI will not perform well when there's cloud cover uh, because obviously it's not an expected land cover type. So let's run the request and probably push a little bit of time. Uh, our request comes back here as a JSON file. You can see it's not particularly useful to look at. Uh, it's quite hard to interpret anything. Um, but we've actually got some helper functions in, within our Jupyter notebook here, which we can run. Firstly, I can convert this to a pandas data frame. This makes the data a lot easier to read, especially for a machine. And we can actually then run the following cell, which outputs a plot in matplotlib. And we can start to see a story developing where our field of interest, you can see the NDVI rising early in the growing season before declining kind of after probably mid, mid June. Um, but to develop our story further, we can start comparing different fields. So we can run the same request again on our second field this time. And using this, we can then plot both on the same uh, graph. And here we can actually really start to perform some interesting analysis. We can see that we're probably looking at two different crop types or maybe two different land cover types, um, which is really useful information, uh, especially for decision makers maybe implementing EU policy, such as the common agricultural policy. Uh, so that kind of concludes the, the notebook I wanted to show you. So we've kind of, I've shown you how you can quickly access the imagery through process API, visualize a vegetation index, and also use statistical API to start running some life analysis using the APIs. Uh, but I really want to emphasize, this is kind of a real taster of what is what you're capable of uh, doing with Sentinel Hub APIs. Uh, and it's kind of limited to your imagination what you can do with them. Okay, so 
to conclude, I want to also talk about how you can scale up your workflow. So I alluded earlier that we also offer APIs that enable you to perform analysis on large timescales, but also large areas as well. And this is possible through the batch processing API. Uh, in addition to that, you also have the batch statistical API, which enables you to analyze thousands of fields at a time. So running what we've just seen in the Jupyter Notebook, but running this for yeah, thousands of fields in one request. Uh, and use cases for this could be monitoring fields on large scales with sentinel imagery. Uh, and what this does is power applications like the Copernicus browser uh, and also numerous other ones as well. Um, so that kind of concludes what I want to say uh, today. So thank you very much for, for listening. Um, I guess we can go into the question now. Yeah, so we do have some questions in the chat. Uh, I'm just going to start maybe at the uh, the first one here. Uh, so Manuel uh, Campagnolo, he has asked if you can at some point compare Sentinel Hub and Google Earth Engine in terms of available computational resources and speed. Okay, that's a, that's a very good question. And yeah, been asked it before. Um, for sure, it's a comparison that we, we should run at some point. Um, but I think for me, um, Google Earth Engine and the Sentinel Hub APIs are arguably quite different, quite different beasts. Um, in that they come up with or they end up with quite a similar product, but they do perform very differently. Uh, Google Earth Engine is very much a closed ecosystem where your data is. Uh, very much stored in like the Google environments, whereas the Sentinel Hub APIs are very much compatible with you downloading your your product and then can maybe even continuing your analysis. Maybe you need to perform some vector-based analysis uh, locally as well. Uh, but for sure, uh, it, personally as well, for me, it'd be very interesting to compare the performance of the, the two different services. As for computer, com computational power, uh, both offer commercial offerings, um, but I'm not familiar enough with the Google Earth Engine offering that I can make a comparison today, for instance. Okay. Thank you. And uh, the next question comes from Pierre Lorenzo Morasco. He asks if Sentinel 2 tiles have an overlap, well, Sentinel 2 tiles have an overlapped area over different tiles. How is this managed? Are you using the same approach as Elemental 84's cloud optimized GeoTIFF tiles? How is this done? Okay, that's a very good question. Um, so what will happen by default with the API is that it will pick the most recent acquisition if there are two tiles which overlap. Uh, so um, I haven't got a specific example in my head, but let's say if one image was collected at 10 o'clock in the morning and the overlapping image was collected on at 10.30 in the morning, the image collected at 10.30 would be the one used uh, by default. But there are some advanced options with uh, tiling with Sentinel Hub APIs uh, documented in the Copernicus database ecosystem docs where you can customize this a little bit. So for instance, you could uh, tailor your request to only use one acquisition per day. Um, uh, and within your eval script, you can even hard code in uh, specific time, time periods so that you get the image that you want. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Moving on to the next question. So there are a couple here from Peter Kongstad. So his first is, is Sentinel-1 RTC analysis ready data? It has been previously paid to use as far as he understands. Is it still paid to use? He also understands that Copernicus will offer S1 RT RTC data in their stack catalog later this year. If and when this is the case, will Sentinel Hub offer S1 RTC for free as well? Uh, so currently, um, kind of due to limitations with um, cloud storage, uh, Sentinel Hub only offers Sentinel-1 GRD currently. Um, 
So I don't think there are plans currently to add this additional Sentinel-1 product, but they, it will be available through one of the other APIs in the ecosystem. Great, thank you. And his second question is, when doing a search for a satellite image related to a geometry, such as a farm field, and the image is sliced to the field, is the query for cloud cover percentage related to this specific field, or is the cloud cover parameter tile-based? Good question. Uh, it's based on the tile. Um, you can also mask out clouds, so you could access the scene classification layer uh, as part of your request. So you could mask out pixels that are cloudy uh, via that method as well. And you could do that in your statistical API request as like an, uh, an additional safeguard. Uh, but the cloud cover percentage in the request or derived from the request is derived from the tile. So the full tile, not just your area of interest. Okay. And Jeff Smith has another question about cloud cover. And he says, when analyzing individual fields, do the cloud cover check still apply to the full scene or the actual fields? Kind of similar to the previous question. Yeah, I think that I just answered that. So yeah, it's the full tile. And uh, we have one final question here from uh, Stamatina uh, Tunta, who says, thank you for the useful webinar. Which API would you recommend using to download data in a local machine? to perform further analysis? Uh, I would still recommend Sentinel Hub. Um, I, I, I'm probably not familiar with your specific application, uh, but for me, even if you wanted to, to still derive NDVI on your local machine, I think it makes much more sense to only download the pixels you need, whether that's for your AOI, which is probably much smaller, and a Sentinel scene, but also just to download the bands you need. So NDVI, you only need band four and band eight of Sentinel two. You don't need the other bands. So why would you download the full full granule? It's a whole gigabyte of data, whereas a Sentinel hub request, you're looking at megabytes instead. Yeah, and I think uh, I think this brings me to well, that's the end of the questions. But then I had just a, a remark here. Maybe you can. You can help the audience. It can be really hard to adapt to new tools and ways of working. And some people are used to working locally. So what do you recommend or what do you think is the best way for people to get started and adapting their processing workflows to CDSE? Uh, so a really good place to start uh, is actually the, the Jupyter Lab that I was uh, demoing earlier. So I will just return back to it. Uh, there's actually a notebook that I wrote last year Cool. Uh, let me just find it. Uh, it's called uh, Migrating Your Work for Workflows from the Copernicus Open Access Hub, which is now retired, to the Copernicus Database Ecosystem. Um, and this kind of gives you an idea of how you can search and discover and download Level 2A data using the Sentinel Hub APIs. Uh, but I'd also recommend going through the other notebooks here as well. Uh, once you pick up the basics, I think it's actually quite easy to pick up uh, the more advanced stuff. Uh, and actually, ultimately, once your application, maybe you do want to upscale it to larger areas. I think it's far less painful to do this with Sentinel Hub APIs uh, than it would be to run it with the more traditional methods where you may need to completely rewrite your workflow. Like for example, the eval scripts I've shown you, these can be applied to the different APIs. So an eval script you used with process API would also be compatible with batch processing API as well. And I think that by maybe having a small learning curve at the start, uh, you will save yourself a lot of pain going forward, especially with upscaling your uh, workflows as well. Yeah, that's uh, that's really great that these notebooks are available to users to really help them adapt to uh, this new way of uh, of uh, their processing their their workflows. Uh, and we looks like we have one more question from Manuel Campagnolo again, and he wants to know which cloud screening methods are available 
on Sentinel Hub. OK, uh, then very simply, uh, through Sentinel Hub on the Copernicus data space ecosystem deployment, you have access to the, the scene classification layer, which is derived through the Sentu call processing uh, undertaken by ESA in generating the level 2A data. Um, you can also derive your own cloud masks, for instance, if you wish. That's the power of the, the eval scripts. So you, you hypothetically, if you wanted, you could train a, a model, maybe a deep learning model, a very lightweight deep learning model. And you could then use this to detect clouds in Sentinel-2 imagery. And the weights from this model could be transferred into an eval script and actually produce a cloud mask in that method as well. Uh, but in the examples, there are uh, methods that show you how you can detect clouds with Sentinel-2 imagery. Fantastic. Thank you very much. So it doesn't look like there are other questions. Uh, I think at this point, I will hand back the floor to uh, Valentin Lupetti, who might have a few closing remarks to close the session. Valentin? Yes, thank you, Ben. Um, I mean, no further remark on my on my side. Just to thank you again, everyone, for um, for these uh, interactive uh, exchanges. I was uh, quite happy to see so many so many questions in the chat and uh, so many technical questions. I would say um, <laughs> it was uh, it was good indeed to draw like parallels with other other programs that are all policies that are implemented, such as the the, uh, the, the, the common agricultural policy that you that you mentioned. And uh, I'm sure we will find uh, many other uh, other use cases where we can use this uh, this Sentinel Hub. I see Stefan, you, you have uh, other comments? No? OK. Uh, so I guess we can wrap up. And just one final thing, I'd just like to remind everyone that the next webinar in the series on CDSE will take place on June 20 uh, at 5.30, and we'll focus on the OpenEO API. So please do join us for that as well. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. And bye.